Good evening, church. Beautiful day to worship God, is it not? Praise God for that. I'm so glad you've decided to join us here. I'll go ahead and commence with the announcements so we can get started with our worship. Uh, but I want to start off by welcoming you. We're happy that you're here. We're blessed by your presence. Of course, those dealing with cancer uh, still request prayers. We always want to keep them on our hearts, keep them in our minds. I want to let you know that this Saturday there's something fun going on. March 27th, there will be a game night at the building for the kids 4th grade and up from 5.30 to 8 p.m. And if you're one of those, I think, at home that this would apply to, please let Shalina Shumpert know if your child plans to be there this Saturday, 5.30 to 8 p.m. at game night for the kids 4th grade and up at the building. Look forward to that, doing more things with our kids. I'm proud we can do that. This Sunday, there will be a wedding shower for Colton Linderman and Gracie Hicks. That's March 28th at 4 p.m. They're registered at Target and the Everyday Chef. Uh, just a reminder, I don't know how much longer we got to put up with these, but during service, please remember to wear your mask. The elders and myself would appreciate that greatly. Uh, bit of good news. I guess if you're Lance, I don't know about Marty, but Lance and Marty are having their anniversary today. Another year somehow, she's put up with Lance. What number is it? 32. Well, congratulations for that. We're proud to see that. Good family here at Grace Point. We appreciate them. Uh, and another small prayer request. Uh, Greg Hogue was going to be our song leader tonight, but his father had a fall, uh, so he's taking care of him. He didn't say how serious it was, but he wanted to take care of him, so pre please keep LJ in your, in your prayers as well. Our opening prayer tonight will be by Brother Mike Frazier, song leader. Randy Larson will take Greg's place. I'll do the devotional. And our closing prayer will be by Brother Alan Gossett. Let's begin our worship with a word of prayer. Will you bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer as we begin our study this evening, and we pray, Father, that you open our hearts and minds, that we may take in willingly the information which we learned this evening. And we pray, Father, for those who are unable to be in attendance with us tonight. We pray that you be with their health and help them to regain it so that they might be able to return to us soon. And we pray, Father, thanking you for all the blessings you give us in life and we are greatly appreciative of those in jesus name amen our first song is 595 verses 1 and three, five ninety five, five nine five, verses one and three. I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through this voice of woe. His voice in me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known our song before the lesson will be 716 verses 1 and 3 716 verses 1 and 3, 716 verses 1 and 3. 
Sing to me a heaven, a song of peace. From the toils that bind me, it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing, so showers of great blessings on my heart will flow. Sing to me, a heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me, a heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadow on me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven's sweetest song of all. Invitation song will be 589 verses 1, 2, and 3. Well, good evening again, church. Should we even tell them, Susan? Okay. <laughs> that, I'll take the blame for that. That was my fault. I saw number two on that sheet you gave me, so each second verse was on the screen <laughs> instead of the third. But we got it done. You sang good ones, so we all got it done. That was fine. Thank you for stepping in and singing. Did a wonderful job. Discipleship is what we're talking <laughs> Okay, it was too. That's fine. I just, uh, I just enjoy you stepping up and taking place and, and singing, so I, I appreciate that whenever you do it. Talking about discipleship tonight, uh, a powerful subject for me whenever I think about it, Something I've, I've always kind of been mindful of in my own life, and hopefully you've been mindful of it as well. If you want to turn to Matthew 16, that's where, uh, that's where a large section of our instruction will come from, Matthew 16. But I want you to have your own inputs as well and your own discussions as well as we think about discipleship, defining our terms, understanding what we're talking about. The world is filled with people who claim to be disciples of Christ. The world is filled with people who claim to be Christians nearly to the point where the word doesn't mean what it should mean anymore. Christian just gets thrown around. It doesn't really mean Christian in the true sense anymore. So we've got to come to an agreement and we've got to define our terms. So as far as you understand it, what is a Christian? I think it's pretty simple. That's a pretty straightforward one. Someone who follows Christ. We get baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. Now we're of Christ, so we're Christian. Now, what's a disciple? Is there a difference? What's the difference between a Christian and a disciple? Is there one? Alan says, not really. That's right. Pharisees were disciples of Moses. You can be a disciple of anyone, but as Christians, as we follow Jesus, as uh, we've already said, we're disciples of him as well. Y'all have got it right. Y'all understand it. It's pretty simple. A disciple, separate but also connected to Christian, a disciple is one who follows the teaching of another. The better terminology or understanding it for myself is a student. One who says, this is my teacher, this is my master, I now live by what he says. And you can be a disciple of anyone. You can be a disciple of your parents or of your boss or anyone. A Christian, if there's a difference, is of Christ. When I'm baptized into Christ and made his and adopted into his family, then I am a Christian. 
But as I follow him, I am also a disciple. But to be a good Christian, I have to be a disciple. And if I'm a disciple, I therefore would be a Christian. So the two are interconnected. But it's the distinction and the separation that really interests me and that I want to look at. Because while they are almost used interchangeably, the two don't really mean the same thing. Disciple is a much stronger word. It carries more responsibility in it. To be a Christian, certainly in today's day and age, means just being a moral person. I don't think that's right. There are terms of Christianity. Salvation comes with terms. But to be a disciple or a Christian disciple carries responsibility. It means you have to follow your leader. You have to live by his words. So what I want us to examine ourselves tonight, uh, I want us to examine ourselves tonight and, uh, and ask ourselves, Am I a Christian disciple? Am I following Jesus? That's what we need to distinguish and learn from ourselves. Because disciple, again, is more student or learner. It's a follower. It's someone who finds the teachings of one other person and clings to them and makes them their rule for their life. That's what we need to do. Jesus' followers were called disciples long before they were ever called Christians. Disciple was actually largely their preferred term. And their discipleship began with Jesus' call. When he said, come and follow me, that was when they became a disciple, when they accepted that call. Later, when they accepted the baptism of Christ, they were made Christians. In Matthew 9.9, 9, we see his call. But the first instance of the word Christian is used in Acts 11.26 at Antioch. The, the church there was called Christians. But the church had other names for themselves. They were called disciples. They called themselves saints. They called themselves brothers, the way, the family. And there are many other names for what we are, but the name Christian means belonging to Christ. So a Christian is someone who belongs to Christ, and since we belong to Christ, we're daily being transformed into a closer image uh, of Him. We're certainly hoping to represent him more each and every day. We belong to him. We have his name. But a true Christian, not just one of name only, will also have to be a disciple. You cannot be a true Christian if you are not also a disciple. So that's where we tie the two in together, and I think acceptingly so. I'm fine to call us Christians or disciples or Christian disciples as long as we bring that responsibility along with it, as long as Christians still mean something to us, then it still stands on its own. But a disciple needs to be involved as well. So the Christian disciple accepts the call and follows Jesus wherever he leads, willingly, voluntarily. We say, you're in charge now, I'm going where you want to go. If I abandon you, I'm no longer your disciple. So we've got to understand, we follow Jesus. The Christian disciple clings to his teachings. Jesus is our number one priority. And we live accordingly to that. So look at Matthew 16, and we see about this idea of discipleship and what it takes to be a disciple, and that's what we'll look at tonight. I'm going to look at verses 24 through the end of chapter 16. Jesus speaking to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 24 through 28. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now if you didn't want to turn to Matthew, if you prefer Mark or Luke, this same uh, speech of Jesus is given in Mark 8 and in Luke 9, and they're almost word for word, but Mark and Luke both include something Matthew does not. So to, to get the whole picture, I wanted to bring this in as well. Mark 8 and Luke 9 also add something to the effect of, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed 
when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So speaking to his disciples, he clarifies discipleship. He says, if you want to come after me, these are the things you need to do. And also, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. If you accept me, I will accept you. So this is where we see the characteristics of disciples. So what, what do you see from those readings? Can we distinguish a disciple from a non-disciple? If so, what are the distinctive characteristics? How can we say you're a disciple and you're not? Does anyone see anything from this scripture? There's th- the sacrifices that need to be made. That's right. Your, priority. Your priorities have to be in order. Well, let's see. Let's look at Matthew 16. You can look at Mark 8 and Luke 9 to make sure I'm speaking straight too. But let's look at Matthew 16 and see what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, right off the bat, we've got to get this straight. Can anyone be a disciple of Jesus? We had a a timid nod from Alan. Yes. There's no special bloodline we have to be. There's no certain degree of sinfulness that we are that uh, disqualifies us from being a disciple. No. Anyone can be a disciple. And again, look at Matthew 16 to back that up. If anyone would come after me. He, He says if anyone. He doesn't say if any Jew, if any Hebrew, if any Gentile even, disqualifying the Hebrews and Jews. He doesn't say that. He says if anyone wants to be my disciple. Now... Will everyone be a disciple? No. Anyone can, but not everyone will be. And this is, again, where we kind of muddy the waters when we bring in too much Christian and not enough disciple. A lot of the world thinks anyone can be and is a Christian. God will save us all. We're all his children. But just as everyone won't be a disciple, not everyone will be a Christian. So we have to understand that. But first, we have to understand that the invitation is offered to everyone. And as Jesus invites anyone, we too should be willing to invite anyone. We should know God desires all men to follow him. If you miss that, you're not reading the right Bible. 1 Timothy 2.9 says he desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. 2 Peter 3.9 says the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So God wants to save everyone. He wants everyone to be a Christian. He wants everyone to be a disciple. But in every instance, he qualifies it. God wants all people to be saved by coming to the knowledge of truth, 1 Timothy 2. 2 Peter 3, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that they come to repentance. So Jesus gave the invitation to everyone. What does that mean if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be a disciple? What's your responsibility then? Accept the invitation. Okay, yes, you are my master. I am now following you. If anyone else is your teacher or your master other than Christ, then by definition, you're not a Christian disciple. You're not a Christian. You're not following Jesus. Jesus invites everyone. And again, he qualifies his invitation. How does he invite us? Well, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 and other instances, I'm not listing them all, says he invites us by his gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 14 says, To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how we become a Christian is the same way we become a disciple, but discipleship carries with it, again, maybe uh, living faithfully the sixth step of salvation. But accepting the invitation that Jesus offers here in Matthew 16, if anyone wants to come after me, hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, those things still stand in their proper order as first steps. We can't bypass hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized and call ourselves disciples, call ourselves Christians. Well, accurately call ourselves. We can say that we're disciples, we can say that we're Christians, but we would be wrong 
But because we don't know who he is, we haven't confessed our sins, we haven't put off our old self, we haven't been baptized, so we're not of Christ because we're not in Christ. So we still have to do those necessary steps first to be a Christian. And then, once you've been brought into Jesus, remaining in him is what discipleship is. Maintaining your own heart, maintaining the hearts of your family and your friends, that's what discipleship is. An example of this anyone and and an example of this process of coming into Christ is the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Famously, the Philippian jailer, just doing his job, had Paul prisoner. And then after an earthquake, he thought his prisoners had escaped. He was going to kill himself rather than face the wrath of the king. And in verse 30 through 34, it picks up. The Philippian jailer brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So we've got believe there. Verse 32 to 34. They spoke the word of the Lord to him. The invitation came through the gospel and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So to accept the invitation, you have to believe the invitation. You have to understand, okay, Jesus can save me. I can't save myself. I need to give my life to him. And then you've got to act that out. Just like the Philippian jailer, you've got to believe the words are true and then act upon them by being baptized. And then your discipleship can begin. Your Christian faith can begin. So look at Matthew 16 and we'll continue. So we've already established Anyone can be a disciple, but not everyone will be. The invitation is offered to everyone. So as we now offer the invitation to everyone, and we have to be discerning, seeking to find true followers of Jesus, and also being aware of liars, we need to find some characteristics of disciples. And Jesus gives us three in verse 24. The th- what are the three things he says that define discipleship? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's what we're going to look at tonight. That's not exhaustive, but if you look at the big picture, if you're carrying your cross daily, uh, you're living faithfully, you're holding your tongue, you're being a good spouse, you're doing all of those things because you're being a faithful Christian. So just in the sense that we can envelop everything in the faith, we'll do so with these three points. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. So, this is how we tell if someone is a true disciple or not. The first thing Jesus says is that you have to deny yourself. You've got to make sacrifices. Your priorities have to be right. How do we do that? It's not really something we say often, deny yourself. How do we do that? How do we put that into practice? What does denying yourself look like? Someone translate it for me. Embracing God's will, no matter what Embracing God's will, no matter the cost, at the expense of what? Your own will. That's exactly right. Anyone else? Yeah, everything physical about us that's not spiritual about us, the sinful man that I am has its longings, and he was saying we've got to deny that. We've got to put away our desires, and we've got to desire what God desires. Anyone else? What denying yourself looks like. In a word, oh, yeah, Randy? Put others in front of of ourselves, that's exactly right. I need to learn that lesson every day. In a word, I think uh, think it's humility. It's just humility. Humbling ourselves for God, 
We can't be humble towards man or towards anyone else. That's a, a wrong kind of humility. It serves no purpose. Maybe be a good son, be a good daughter, be a good coworker in putting others' interests before your own. But putting God first is what matters most. So be humble to God. That's what denying yourself looks like. It's His will, not our own. We need to say the prayer that Jesus said in the garden. It's your will. It's not mine. Let your will be done, not mine. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20 says, you were, brought with, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your body's not your own, Craig. Those urges that you feel, you cannot chase after them and be pleasing to God. The gift that you've been given in this life on earth is to just be given back to God. That's what 1 Corinthians 6 tells us. Philippians 2.4 about what Randy was saying. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul famously said, he must increase, I must decrease. That's what denying yourself looks like. It's not nihilism. It's not a depreciation of yourself to the point where you're always kicking yourself, you're always beating yourself down, always tearing yourself down. That's taking it too far to an unhealthy level. You have validity, you have value in Christ, but you don't have value over any other man and you don't have value over God. So we've always got to keep that in mind. And the more humble you are, the more you deny yourself, the more other people will enjoy your company, the more you'll enjoy other people. Being selfish is not a good way of life. Of denying themselves, can you think of any good examples in Scripture that maybe we can think of that would clear, clarify this for us? I've just got three, but Scripture's filled with them. The rich young ruler? So that's a good example of what not to do. We'll get to, I have some bad examples down as well. Anyone think of some good examples? That's a great lesson. That fits perfectly in the second point. The poor widow. The poor widow. By putting in two pennies, she's put far more than anyone else. Giving away her life to help the church. How about Ruth? Ruth. Ruth sacrificing her young life to take care of Naomi. That's right. Moses was one. Hebrews 11 says he didn't want to be called the son of Pharaoh. He denounced the power of the known world at the time because he wanted to be called an Israel. He wanted to be with his people. A good one is Paul. In Philippians 3, Paul talks a lot about his fight to deny himself. And he kind of skirts around it. He kind of flirts with bragging about himself. He says, if anyone has anyone to boast about it, it's me. According to the law, I'm guiltless, Philistine, uh, Pharisee of Pharisees, Jew of Jew, Roman of Roman, I'm it. But in verse 7 through 8 of Philippians 3, he says, But whatever I had, whatever gain I had, I counted it as what? As loss. For the sake of Christ. It's not worthless for no reason. It's worthless compared to knowing Jesus. Indeed, he says, verse 8, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Whatever I got doesn't mean a thing to me. Jesus is all that I care about. And then Jesus. The greatest example of denying yourself has to be Jesus. And the action, more than any of his other actions of humility, that says that is the cross. Uh, again in Philippians, this time chapter 2, says, Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So if you need examples of self lessness of humility, of denying yourself, look to these three and look to the others that we've mentioned. Those show us the powerful examples of what it looks like to deny yourself. And in every one of those examples, did they have a better life or a worse life because of their denial of self? A better life. Now, Mike was jumping ahead. What are some bad examples in Scripture 
of those who did not deny themselves. Satan, at the, that's a great example. He's the king of that. At the very beginning of creation, he wanted equity with God, equality with God. Eve. Eve. Adam, too. We can lump Adam in as well. Ananias. They, hmm? Ananias, I've got them down as well. Ananias and Sapphira. They lied about their gift, wanting to look better than they were. What happened to them? They were struck down. Any other bad examples? These are just as good as the good examples to learn from. Judas, I've got Judas down as well. He was either looking to spur Jesus into action to form a physical kingdom on earth, or he was just out of greed, influenced by Satan to betray Jesus for just a couple pieces of silver. He didn't deny himself. He denied Jesus. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees, every single one of them, their self was their biggest idol in their eyes. Moses was bigger than Jesus in their eyes. So maybe you don't even have to deny Jesus and accept yourself. You can deny Jesus for someone else. My, I can put my family in Jesus' place. I deny Jesus, but I follow my family. That's a worthwhile thing to do, but it's not going to get me to heaven. So the Pharisees and Sadducees teach us a lot about humility. One, one that you might have forgotten about and one that I don't think about often, in Joshua 7, there's a man named Achan. After, after Jericho had been conquered, God said, give everything to the temple. Give everything to me. All of the spoils are mine. Well, Achan, he admitted it later. He saw the treasures. He took some. He buried them underneath his tent. And because of his actions, Joshua 7 said, the Lord's anger burned against Israel. You want to talk about some consequences for not denying your physical lust? He wanted those things, so he took them. Because he did that, the Lord's anger burned against all of Israel. Well, he was stoned. His life was taken from him, and as soon as that happened, God removed his anger because it had been made right. So denying yourself, uh, these are just a few examples. There's more in Scripture of bad and good. Those who did not deny themselves did not do what they thought they were doing. They didn't have a better life. They were pursuing a better life. They said, if I pick me, if I choose me, I know I can take care of myself. I know I care about my own self-interests and I will fulfill them. But in every single instance we see that happen in Scripture, their life only gets worse. And for some reason we think we can get away with it in our lives. We deny God for ourselves, for our physical desires, thinking that we can have the best of both worlds. At the end of the day, it's going to end poorly for us if we don't deny ourselves. And that's a difficult daily struggle that we've got to fight. Any other comments about denying yourself? Doesn't it come down to If I could master contentment, I don't know if I'd need anything else in this life. Battling against contentment is largely what the world is doing. We've got to struggle with that. Well, what's the next thing we've got to do according to Matthew 16? After we deny ourselves, and only after we deny ourselves, what do we do next? Take up his cross, is what Jesus says. So... Is the order of operations important there? Can I take up my cross before I deny myself? Mike, you say no. Mm-hmm. Got to be beat down before we can get up and go. I, this has been tried far too often by myself and many other Christians. When I'm not in the right mental state, spiritual state, hey, because I'm a good Christian boy, let me pick up my cross and let me carry it. Now, when I haven't denied myself, maybe I'm doing it with the wrong heart, with the wrong motives. Look at all you. Can you not see me picking up my cross? Shouldn't you do the same? Well, that's the wrong attitude. I've got to drop it and I've got to go backwards. 
If I take up the wrong cross because I've not denied myself, I make a misstep as well. So I've got to be broken. I've got to be brought low and then go crawling back to Jesus and then say, I willingly take on the cross. And this is not just a little simple turn of phrase that Jesus is using here. Take up your cross is deadly serious language. This is not just go to church once a week that Jesus is saying here. Live discipleship is what he's saying here. Follow me every single day, even if you'll have to bear the burdens and the suffering that I bore in my life. Take up your cross. It's not just about everyday trials. We have a rough Monday and we can say, oh, I really had to bear my cross today. I didn't have coffee when I talked to Karen this morning at work, so boy, my... Sorry, any Karens. That's not what it's talking about here. Jesus saying, take up your cross, he's talking about spiritual matters. Voluntarily put the burden of being Christian on your back so that when you enter the lion's den, when you go out into the world, they'll know something's different about you and because of that, they'll attack you. They'll persecute you, they'll ridicule you, they'll make fun of you. If you've not experienced it yet, young people, ask anyone else here and they'll tell you. Being a Christian it comes with some difficulty. It comes with some pain. It, den- taking up your cross means enduring hardships for God because of your faith. That's specifically what he's talking about here. That's voluntary. That's not something that's in your nature that people are going to attack because it's what you're made of. You choose to accept Christ and then you're attacked by Satan and his efforts because of that choice. We see good examples of the early Christians choosing these trials, facing them with strength and courage, praying about it, being scared about it, being timid, making mistakes along the way. But if they took up their cross, they would be blessed. They would be fulfilled. The world hadn't changed that much in 2,000 some odd years. Satan is still at work in this world, attacking us, removing faith from the world as much as he can. We've still got to be those who take up the cross. And we may be ridiculed. 1 Peter 4, 3-4 is the good example of this. It says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. This talks about our physical desires. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. With respect to this, They are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Some translations conjure an idea of jumping into a pit. Why would you not join us in this filth? Why don't you jump in? The water's fine. Malign you. That's something we don't hear often. Ridicule you, make fun of you, pick you apart just because you choose Christ and they don't. And we still have to extend the invitation. Hey, anyone, you're anyone. If you want to join me, you can. I can't join you because I'll condemn myself. I'll condemn my family. I'll throw away my eternal salvation. I'm not willing to do that. But I'm willing to extend my invitation to you. That's what taking up your cross means. And sometimes we won't only be rejected by the world. Sometimes we may be rejected by our families as well. I've seen far too often young people refuse to be baptized because, well, my cousin's not. And if I'm baptized and my cousin's not, that means they're going to hell. So I just, I'll pretend it's not a thing so I won't get baptized. Matthew 10, 36 says a person's enemies will be those of his own household. That's what taking up your cross means. Putting Jesus and the burden of the cross before anyone else. That's why denying yourself comes first. Because if you do not deny yourself first, and you start getting maligned, whatever that is, when your family members start attacking you, you'll drop the cross. It's heavy. It takes a lot of work. You're often dragging it uphill. You're often carrying it alone. The world's certainly not going to help you. You can only do it because of the strength that Jesus provides. But even then, because of our inner struggles, it's a difficult job to do. So that's what taking up your cross means. It's deadly serious. We've got to convey that truth when we bring in new converts, when we bring in new Christians. Hey, you get to go to heaven. This is going to be an incredible life for you. 
but it's not going to be an easy one necessarily. You're not promised an easy life here on this earth. It's what comes after that's worth it. So that's what true discipleship looks like. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and, and then what? After denying yourself, after taking on the burden of the cross, what then are you told to do and then allowed to do? Follow me. If you go to Jesus full of, with your hands full of yourself, with the cross left behind, he's not going to accept you. If you deny yourself, but you're not taking on the burden that comes with Christianity, he's not going to let you follow him. You've got to deny yourself, then take up the cross, then you can and should follow Jesus. And you're allowed to do so after you do those things first. So following Jesus, it goes back to the difference of, of, of disciples. A disciple is someone who follows someone. A disciple of Jesus is someone who follows Jesus. You cannot accept the call of Jesus and not follow him. You cannot be a Christian and not follow Jesus. If you do not follow Jesus, then you are not a Christian. And you can fall out of grace. You can have that name removed from you. You're normally the one who takes the name off. So we've got to maintain our relationship with Jesus. As disciples, we look for God for guide. We look to God for guidance. You're the one in charge, you're the teacher, you tell me what to do. That's what following Jesus means. Look to God and no one else. 1 Peter 2 verse 21 says, For to this you have been called, and because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so you might follow in his steps. Follow Jesus' example. That's what follow me looks like. We don't have the physical manifestation of God on earth like the apostles had. So we can't follow a man in this life. We have to follow Jesus. So we follow his example, we follow his word, and we allow ourselves to be guided by his spirit. That's the only way I know to follow Jesus. And to not do so, we're going to walk into condemnation. So we have to look to Jesus. We can't look to the wisdom of the world. We follow Jesus like a true disciple should. And then, if you do that, then we can look at the conclusion of Matthew 16. If we are disciples, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we follow Jesus, then we experience rewards. Whoever would save his life will lose it. If you deny your life, if you take up your cross, if you follow Jesus, you've lost your life here on this earth. But I'll tell you, it's a pretty good trade for the life to come. You want to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, he will find it. That's what Jesus says. If you don't do that, what good does it serve you? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come, verse 27, with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. There's two kinds of retribution. There's good and there's bad. When God repays me, I want to receive his mercy, not his condemnation. So I've got to be a true disciple to receive that mercy. And then he says, hey, some of you here with me today, you're going before I come back. You won't even taste death. Just more promises for eternal life from Jesus given to his true disciples. So he says, our souls are worth more than the entire world. That's pretty valuable. And if you are faithful, you will be rewarded. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So as we look at discipleship, discipleship requires a total commitment. Luke 14 verse 33, Jesus says, Any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is saying, in no uncertain terms, sacrifice is expected. Work, effort, discipleship is expected. We must deny ourselves or we cannot be accepted by him. Not all of Jesus' followers were able to make such a commitment. After some of Jesus' teaching in John 6, 66, it says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. If you think people turned back and no longer walked with him, by definition, you think they're disciples anymore? 
No. Matthew 10, 38 says, Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Luke 14, 27 says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is serious stuff. We've got to make sure. Am I a disciple? You can use the term Christian and disciple inter- interchangeably because they do mean the same thing if they both mean what they mean. If you're using the, the world's definition of Christian, you're not a true disciple. If you're using the real definition of Christian, a true Christian disciple is a believer in Christ. And because he is a believer in Christ, he is then a disciple of Christ. The two go hand in hand. We have new life through the Holy Spirit. Because we love Jesus, we will be an obedient disciple. That's, that's a list we've got to get right too. Love God before you follow Him or you won't. Any other comments about discipleship, about denying yourself, taking your cross, and following Jesus before we conclude? I think the best thing we can do in this is lead by example. I think a lot about raising preacher's kids. And there's some stigmas that come with that, and sometimes preacher's kids fall away. That scares me. So to make sure that doesn't happen to the best of my ability in that Sadie and Ellie will one day be individual people, I've got to lead by example. A good way of doing that is following the good examples I see in Scripture and reminding myself, I've got to deny myself, I've got to take up my cross, and I've got to follow Jesus. If you've not done that, if you're following after yourself, if you're following after the world, if you're not taking on your cross daily, If you need to be baptized tonight to be a Christian for once and for all, if we can help you in any way tonight, we can baptize you or we can pray for you as we stand and sing to encourage you. Please come. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Our song before our closing prayer is 238. We'll sing this through two times. 238, we'll sing it through two times. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise in your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, 
You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise in your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for such a beautiful day that you've given us with springtime coming. See this rebirth of the world around us. Lord, pray that you be with the sick of our number here. Lord, be with those that are still at home, able, not able to be with us at this point. Lord, pray that you comfort them. and Lord, be with us as, through the remainder of this week that uh, we continue to strive to take up our call at cross and follow you, that we may always be denying ourselves. Lord, I know that you know that it's hard for us to do at times. Lord, as always, thank you so much for the gift given to us and that of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through his blessed name we do pray. Amen.